like that sound. <laughs> That's the sound of uh, the end of Zazen or the beginning of Zazen, when you're supposed to meditate and give things your full attention. Um, I think that was the most valuable thing I ever learned as a reporter, was to shut up and listen. Because I'm a very talkative person, so I'm going to be talking for the next 15 minutes. But um, it's important to listen. The, the person who told me that was Detective um, Sekiguchi Chiaki. And what he told me was, it's very important to learn to listen if you're going to be a reporter, to know the truth. And you should listen with your ears and your skin and your nose and your entire body and everything you have, but never with your eyes or with your mouth, which sounds kind of counterintuitive. But it actually turned out to be very good advice. Um, because most of the time, when we're listening to people, we're not really listening. We're distracted. We're playing with our iPhones, or we're watching the slides. In my case, we've got no slides behind me, so there's nothing to watch yet. Um, but we're not really into what the person is saying. Uh, and learning to listen is the first thing you need to do as a reporter, because once you learn how to listen, you start getting answers to the questions you want. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today are the things that I've learned as a reporter. I have been a reporter in Japan since 1993. Since 1994, I was assigned to cover the Organized Crime Control Division in Saitama Prefecture, which means that I had to cover the Yakuza. Um, in Kansai, they call them Gokudo. Um, the police call them Boryokudan. Um, you can call them thugs. Um, you can call them whatever you like. Um, they call themselves Ninkyo Dantai, humanitarian organizations. Um, the police that arrest them and kick their butts are called Marubo Keiji, or um, Sosionka. Um, there's a lot of names for them. So uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today are the things that I've learned, um, the ideas that I think are worth sharing um, from 18 years of dealing with the cops and the Yakuza. Basically, everything I ever needed to know I learned in life from uh, the Yakuza are the cops that bust them. Shippai wa seiko no moto, which is failure is the foundation of success. We just talked about listening. When you're a newspaper reporter, one of the things that they teach you is to write your articles in reverse pyramid. And why do you do this? You do this so that when the editor is editing, he can cut from the bottom up um, when you're running up against a deadline. So you always start with the conclusion, the most important things you have to say. You follow it by the supporting details, and then you follow it by summing up what you just told the person that you were going to tell them, and you tell it again. Uh, which is exactly what I'm going to do now. Here are the seven things that I've learned um, that I think are worth sharing. I I've learned some things from the Yakuza that are ideas definitely not worth sharing. <laughs> or if you ever have a, a TED talk on ideas that are threatening, um, they would work. <laughs> the first is learn to listen. Uh, learn to listen well. And if you can't hear the spaces or the silences between someone's words, then you're not really listening to them. Those were Sekiguchi's words, and I've taken them to heart. The second one is honor your debts, have a code, live up to it, everything's good. There are no small promises. Every promise is as important as a man's life. It's okay to be betrayed, but you never want to be the betrayer. Um, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. <laughs> a man without any enemies is probably a worthless man. In life, we only encounter the injustices we were meant to correct. And finally, if you want to live well, you need to die once. So we'll go back to the beginning. We've already talked about listening, and I see that you're all listening, which is good. Um, since we've hit the main points, if you want to go back to your iPhone, be my guest. In the last year, I've spent a lot of time talking to Yakuza and ex-Yakuza, and I've been impressed that some of these guys have a tremendous sense of inner peace and calm that you wouldn't expect from a criminal. And so I asked one of the bosses who, who seemed to be the most at home with himself, you know, why are you so calm? You're kind of like a Buddha. And he said, oh, you know, which is, you know, I pay my debts, I follow my code, and everything's good with me. If you ask yourself, where does your sense of self-worth come from? Um, I think we'd all have different answers. Uh, some people would answer, it's, it's how I look. 
It's how much money I have. It's my job. It's my position. When you're talking about intrinsic values, what you're really talking is about do you have a code? Do you have a code of honor that you live up to? And if you live up to that and you're true to it, is that something that gives you inner peace? And while I'm not a fan of the Yakuza, and I certainly don't want to say good things about them, uh, there are some of them that actually do live up to their code of honor, as, as limited as it may be, and they seem at peace with themselves. Uh, not many people know it, but um, the Yakuza do have a code. Uh, at least they used to. Um, the Yakuza in Japan, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, uh, are very public. They still have office buildings. They still have business cards. Um, they still have fan magazines. They still even have comic books about these guys. So they're pretty much out in the open. And you have to wonder, why does Japanese society tolerate these people? Because they've been around since uh, the Second World War, since in Kyoto, since 1870. Um, Aizuko Tetsukai uh, is one of the oldest organized crime groups around. Um, one of the reasons they're tolerated is that they used to keep a sort of bare minimum code of ethics. And those are the ones up behind me. What were the code of ethics that the Yakuza had? They were, don't steal, don't rob, no sexual assault, no using or selling drugs, and nothing in contra that's contrary to the humanitarian way. Um, the humanitarian way has always been poorly defined. Um, you'll also notice that amongst those things that are forbidden, um, extortion and blackmail are not included. And if you ask the Yakuza boss why extortion and blackmail are acceptable, he'll tell you. Um, it's because if you're doing something so bad, that you're being black by, blackmailed by the Yakuza, you probably deserve the punishment you're getting. Um, so we're imposing a social fine on these people and, and making society a better place. Um, it's kind of hard to argue with that. Um, I will say that the Yakuza, for the most part, are a pestilence on Japanese society. They're not a force for good. But in the days when they were upholding some sort of code of honor, uh, at least they were contributing to the peace in some senses. Uh, that's not that way to now. I once was supposed to visit a Yakuza boss in, in Omiya in 1995. Um, Kaneko Naoya, he's since passed away in Sumi Yoshikai. I showed up at his office at 7.25 and I was supposed to be there at 7 o'clock. Uh, so I showed up and he was furious. And he was like, you broke your promise. You were supposed to be here at 7 o'clock and you're here at 7.25. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, I was busy. And he's like... That's not good enough. Uh, you know, uh, you broke your promise. You said that you would be here at 7 p.m. and you're here at 7.25. Go home. And, and I was like, what's your problem? I mean, it's, it's, I'm late, but you know, it was a small promise. And he said to me, there are no small promises. He said, in our world, and if you're going to be part of it, you have to understand that a man's worth is his word. If you can't keep your word, then you're worthless. I'm a Yakuza, this is what he said, and sometimes we go to war. We go to war over stupid things, quarrels, money, turf. And if we're going to go to war, let's say we're going to go head to head with the Nakano Kai, and my man is supposed to be in his place at 7 o'clock and he's not there, that means that someone is going to have to go in alone. And if they go in alone, they may get killed. Or we may have to scrub the entire thing, but everything is ruined because one person didn't show up on time. In this world, in the world of cops, in the world of journalists, in the world of the Yakuza, you build trust by keeping your promises. Every time you say that you'll call and you don't call, you lose points. Every time you say you'll do something and you do it, you gain trust. Eventually, if you keep your word long enough, people will trust you and they will tell you things. And when they do that, you, then you'll be an excellent reporter. Um, promises are hard things to keep. And one of the things that uh, Kaneko said to me that I remember very well is that you need to learn not to make promises lightly. And when you do make promises, you need to know the difference between the promises you didn't keep and the promises you couldn't keep. Because in the end, in our world, the measure of a man is the promises he's made and the promises he, he's kept. This was said to me by Yakuza boss, and it's not that profound, but it is actually probably very true. He said that it's okay to be 
betrayed, that everybody gets betrayed in the, in the Yakuza business because actually they're a bunch of cutthroats. I mean, they talk about honor, but they're always undercutting each other. But he said, you never want to be the one that betrays your friend uh, that, isn't, that doesn't provide support, that isn't there when you say you'll be, that you're not there when you'll say you'll be there. Because if you can't be loyal to your own friends, how can you expect them to be loyal to you? Uh, once you betray someone, it sets out a circle betrayal. And in a sense, you're also betraying yourself. Because if you can't keep your word, how can you expect anyone else to keep your word? In principle, this is a very easy thing to live up to. But in practice, it gets very difficult. For example, let's say you have two friends from college, uh, Taro, uh, Taro and Hanako. So you find out that Hanako is having a torrid affair with another man. Taro suspects something, he asks you. Now, there's no way to answer that question without betraying one of them or betraying both of them. So what do you do? Um, and by the way, if you are the one that's sleeping with Hanako, then you've already broken this rule. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. You can tell a lot about a man uh, by his enemies um, even more than you can by his friends. Uh, a man without enemies is no man at all. Uh, that sounds like a Yakuza kind of thing to say. That was actually said to me by Detective Sakaguchi, um, his advice on how to be a better investigative reporter. Um, if you're a good journalist, especially a good investigative journalist, people won't like you. Um, it comes with the territory. If you write the truth and you expose someone as a liar, they're not going to like you. If you stand up to a bully, there's a chance that he'll come bully you next. If you confront a stalker, guess who he'll be stalking soon? Um, I have a feeling that I'm not very much liked by the management of Tokyo Electric Power Company. So I don't write very nice things about them. Um, I've written that uh, the management should be prosecuted for criminal negligence uh, resulting in death and injury. Um, that's okay. I'm quite happy to be on unfriendly terms with them because there are a lot of other people that don't like TEPCO right now. Some politicians, some regulators, some police officers. And for the moment, we have a common enemy. And while we have a common enemy, we're friends for the time being. In life, we only encounter the injustices we were meant to correct. Uh, these were the words told to me by Igari Toshiro, who was a, an ex-prosecutor, um, infamous for tackling organized crime. Um, and he did something very unusual and he retired from being a prosecutor. Um, he actually went and continued to fight against organized crime. Uh, most prosecutors in Japan, the, the, the term Yamiken Bengoshi, um, former prosecutor turned lawyer, it basically means uh, scumbag. No offense to uh, law enforcement. But most prosecutors end up quitting and then going to work for the Yakuza or crooked politicians because they can get them off. They know how to do it and they have the connections. The Igari-san felt that uh, the Yakuza and organized crime were pestilence on Japanese society and so he fought against them. Um, the legislation that's now on the books called the Boorokudan Haijo Jorei, those were designed by um, Igari Sensei. Um, it's basically all the laws that we now have in Japan that say you can't pay off organized crime, you can't provide them with money, you can't work with their front companies. Um, those ordinances were created from his brain. Uh, he probably did more to revolutionize Japan's crackdown on the Yakuza than anyone before him. Um, keep in mind that the war on the Yakuza has been going on since 1965. That makes it like longer than the war on terror with not much results. Um, what Igari-san has said has also been mirrored by other people. Albert Einstein once said, um, the world is a dangerous place not because of the people who are in it and do evil, but because of those who see it and do nothing about it. Um, Hundreds of centuries before that, the Omaha Indians said, he was present at a wrongdoing and, nothing, and does nothing about it is just as guilty as the wrongdoers. Uh, they're profound words. Um, you would like to think that correcting injustice is, is a good thing, um, and there's a reward for it, but sometimes there's not a reward. Um, in Igari's case, the last time I saw him, and the time that he told me those, those words that I remember, we only encountered the injustices that we were meant to correct was August 8th, 2010, and 10 days later he was dead uh, under various mysterious circumstances. Which brings us to the last slide. Death, not a cheery subject. 
You know, death is kind of like the Facebook friend that everybody has but nobody wants. You, you can't unfriend them, and when they poke you, it hurts. Uh, when she finally defriends you, you die. But if you're going to live a life that is meaningful and heroic, you can't be afraid of death. Um, so, die once. Get it over with. Um, these are the words of the Zen Buddhist priest, um, Shido Bunan, which are before you. These were first said to me by a detective who, who had a gun put in his face and uh, didn't go off, and he lived. Uh, he said then he finally understood what these words mean. Die while you are alive and be absolutely dead. Then do whatever you want. It's all good. So, in the greater scheme of things, you know, we all are going to die sooner or later. Um, so it's best to enjoy life while we still have it. And when you get up in the morning and you're feeling a little bit down about how things are going in your life, think, of, think about it this way. Every day we wake up not dead is a very good day. Thank you.